3,000. What is doing? My name is Maloney. This is a 3,000 podcast. I'm joined today by artist and old mate, Buff Dis. Thanks for coming, Buff. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having us on. Uh, you've made the trek all the way from the other peninsula, so I'm glad you've made it down here. Hopefully, you can fit in a surf while you're here. But uh, let's start like we always do with where you grew up. Tell us about where Buff grew up. Well, I grew up probably a few blocks away from you. <laughs> so in a little area called Middle Park, but most people would know St Kilda, Port Melbourne, South Melbourne. Mm-hmm. It's changed a little bit. It was very working class back in the day. But, yeah, so I was pretty... Pretty, I think we were both pretty lucky to grow up in that area at the time. It, pretty formative with, you know, the different demographic that we had at that time. It was very Greek. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, which is great. I mean, pretty thankful for like having the Greek crew that I grew up with. Thank you, Paul and Nika. Allah There you go. Yeah. I just know the swear words. Yeah, that was yeah, that was a nicer version. But yeah, it was great going to. Greece, actually visiting Greece and realizing like so much of the backyards and all those little cultural elements, like name days and everything. Like, oh, this is legit. Like, mm-hmm. and that's what I think is funny. Like, with Melbourne, I was having a chat before I came here about what is Melbourne. And, mate, the Melbourne we grew up with, it's what Greek, Asian, European. Like, I don't even know how you define it to someone overseas. Yeah. And it's cool how all the different little areas have their different cultural hubs and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, you can go 10 minutes down the road and you'll find a different sort of ethnicity that have made it home and, you know, their foods and all that sort of stuff. That yeah, makes it awesome. I'm pretty lucky. We're lucky indeed. So I know that you were skateboarding, but what were you doing? Were you skateboarding? <laughs> oh, from, the, from, the, from birth? <laughs> no, well, what were you do- early days, early days, what were you doing to pass the time? Tell you what I was doing. Was collecting basketball cards with you, that South we, Melbourne Market, <laughs> yeah. with Jerry, Adina, our mate Adina. She That's used to right. work there. That's I'm still right. friends with Adina to this day. No and Adina, uh, she calls me all the time, and I screen her calls because she always wants something. But no, Adina used to sell the basketball cards in the fucking meat aisle of the South Melbourne Market. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, but I guess yeah. So like, I think like everyone, skating is like the gateway drug mm-hmm. into graffiti or street art. But yeah, I love skating. I had a um, remember when like libraries were like used to. It was just a thing. Everyone would go to the libraries. You had a library pretty, at the end of your street, mate. And it was just so good. I remember I found an old skateboard like book that mm-hmm. you know how to skate or whatever. But at the back it had like a how to build a mini wrap. Yeah. So I showed it to my grandpa, and yeah, that's where the skate skate began. And then you start noticing a few little scribbles around. Mm-hmm. The skate parks. Remember, actually, skate parks in general. Remember what, like, the Wild West kind of places those used to be? Yeah. And now it's, like, almost like an Olympic training ground. But, yeah, I guess that was sort of where I started to get into the stuff that I, you and I had fun with. Fun. Yeah, and that was a thing, like, where we grew up, it was suburbia to an extent and it was pretty working class, but we only had to go f- – two minutes on two tram stops to find St Kilda. You only had to go about 15 minutes on two trams to find Paran Chapel Street. So we were pretty in the hub of that sort of cultural stuff that was like interesting, you know what I mean? I think we're pretty lucky. I mean, even though I think, you know, for listeners that maybe don't know about graffiti, like the loops and the actual train system was really pivotal in graffiti. But where we were was that kind of little 40-40 safe zone, that little bubble that you had access to like, the city you had access to different train lines, but it, you weren't on it. So you have this weird sort of, not a safe place, but like a weird sort of escape zone from the intensity of the city. Like mm-hmm. if you had beef, it was always sort of somewhere to get get safe to. Or that's how I sort of felt about it growing up. And so you you're skating, you're hanging around on the trams because. That's what you do. That's how we'd get around. And you start to see, you know, trackside pieces and that sort of thing. What sort of gets you into graffiti or this sort of art culture? Well, there's a lot of stuff that I was exposed to, but I think one of the most pivotal moments was actually one of your past guests, Jumble. Mm -hmm. When he did that Stormtrooper on the 96 line, it just blew my mind because I'd always seen graffiti as letters and characters and whatever always appreciated characters but just thought that was like a 
a separate thing you, you, you could do next to a piece, not realising what if, if you just did that. Mm. And it blew my mind. And that actually sort of I think was probably one of the most pivotal things in my life where I realised the characters that you'd see on sort of skateboard, you know, decks and so on. Yep. They were actually, you know, Mike Giant and different, like they're actually graffiti pieces of art in themselves. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, that was probably where it started for me. And that's a, a pivotal point where you realise, okay, graffiti can be more than just letters and numbers and tags. It can be something that's more character-driven or something that even is abstract in a way. <laughs> well, I think maybe it was the point where I didn't have to feel so bad always being on character duty or back, background duty with the crew, like, as you know. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's tricky because I think I grew up in that pre-internet slash internet time when graffiti was something you had to learn about, not, you couldn't, you, by, by luck or like, you know, older brothers or stuff like that, which I didn't have, but it was one of those things where you sort of had, there was a, a barrier to the entry point where you had to sort of like commit mm -hmm. and if you wanted to play with it, then you had to like, you know, put in effort and now it's just so accepted that, that you can be creative, whereas the Melbourne that when we were growing up, it's like letters, letters, be staunch, <laughs> respect, you know, get respect through the traditional means. And yep. then even like our, well, my old painting buddy Vids, you know, it, we'd go bombing and it always say to me, stop doing that art shit. Like, stop, like, mm. stop doing the characters. Like, just do the letters. Couldn't help it. Mm. Couldn't help it. And then, yeah, I, I guess now people just accept that there are other forms of graffiti or if you want to use the term street art, like it's accepted. But in the 90s, it probably wasn't. You just sort of, that was a weird thing that people were doing because the street art explosion, for lack of a better term, hadn't really happened. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe I was lucky because going back to like libraries at school, there was the site Art Crimes mm -hmm. and I just studied that like a Bible. Yeah. And I'd, every chance I got, go into the school library, get onto Art Crimes. It was heavily European, was it? No, it was American-based, but they had lots of chapters. And yeah. so like one of the... Um, like I think I probably read this, like there was an interview at Atom from Sydney, not the German fellow, but his interview on that art crimes, like I think I studied the pieces like literally like scripture mm -hmm. and I was so amazed by his work and that was probably the one of the biggest influences at the time then but also back then Barry McGee, Twist, mm -hmm. was famous for doing his characters. His letters are amazing, they still are, you can't do any better letters I don't think but the letters his screws and his faces were just that spoke to me in a way that it wasn't until Ojimios the twins from Brazil um until I saw their work that was probably the next time where I realized hang on like art graffiti doesn't have to be tough letters I mean it is mm -hmm. but there's this other aspect where it's like well just like was your know, basket's getting up like all the rules of graffiti are bizarre when the premise is not obeying the rule of yep. private property. But then, yeah, I mean, sort of this funny idea of freedom until you meet graffiti writers and you realise, <laughs> oh, it's Lord of the Flies, Angry Boys mostly, but, yeah, I don't know. It's With the character thing, graffiti definitely went down a different path because the early days the characters were all copied from comic books and other other characters. So I guess the whole creating your own individual personalised character is kind of cool and that sort of changed in the 90s a bit I think mm. and that people thought oh, I can actually make a character that's original to myself and use that as my own personal sort of fucking graffiti brand. Yeah, I mean I think from my perspective the – actually, yeah, I think maybe the best way I can define it is remember the Hawthorne Drains mm -hmm. when we used to go and like, you know, Guardi or whatever – there was this piece that blew my fucking mind when I came out of a tunnel and looked left and it was Lem's, Lemon. He did this fisheye view of a train carriage and I just, I hadn't thought that you could do something like that in a graffiti area and then from that point sort of realised, oh, hang on, that's what all these, graf all these graf graphers do. In that not having to do a piece or like doing a big collaboration wall or something like 
there is just this innate creativity that I'm sure everyone has a similar story of getting drawn into graffiti by seeing those characters, the recognisable cartoons and mm-hmm. so forth, which I find funny because they're all biting comic writer and all that like cheese yeah, wizard. Somebody <laughs> somebody did create that character in the first place. So in yeah. theory you're biting him. But a lot of them become graffiti folklore because this is my take on a B Boy character. This is my take yeah. on the Cheech the mugs, character yeah. or whatever. Yeah, the mugsies and yeah. So yeah, like when Doe's Green came to Melbourne, a friend brought him out to do a show and that was another pivotal moment for me to like speak to someone that I just like just hailed as one of the original kings and he came up with the Muggs character, Muggsy, and speaking to him about, yeah, like his early days in graffiti and it was actually really nice. I think the biggest thing that graffiti's done for me is being able to meet people that you idolise and instead of like maybe other you know, music genres or stuff like that, a lot of the time maybe eight, of, eight out of ten dudes you meet or women that are graffiti stars, they're actually really nice people. Mm-hmm. Two of them are mostly on smack or, you know, like... But, <laughs> Two of them might be on smack. Back in our day kind of thing. But, yeah. yeah, I think it's just been really... That was really wonderful meeting people that I idolise mm-hmm. and realising, oh, they're all really nice people. And I guess from an artistic point of view, not only just meeting them and finding out they're nice people, there's always a chance that you can collaborate with these people some of the times as well, depending on the situation and what fucking social situation you're in. But a lot of the time you might be like, hey, I met this person, they're cool, come paint together. I think that's something that really lucky with that sort of I don't know how you want to define my work like street art or graffiti is that there's just an an accepted base of collaboration that someone visits your city or you're visiting their city Mm -hmm. you just catch up and paint a wall together yep and I think yeah I've been really lucky to be able to have met a lot of people that I really looked up to and then been able to just have a conversation with the artwork Mm -hmm. and not to have to like have the small talk and whatever and yeah it's been yeah wonderful so We'll get into where you're at now eventually, but let's sort of try and keep it linear for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you're still, you know, in your teenage years, you're trying to paint characters, you're trying to find your feet. I guess it takes a lot of artists a long time to find their feet. So did you think about other mediums or is aerosol still the way you wanted to do it? You just wanted to do some non-traditional style of graffiti-inspired art. (laughs) Is that the best way to put it? (laughs) Uh, That's probably the most generous way you could put it. (laughs) I, look, I think I know where you're getting to, but I think, yeah, so I always did traditional graffiti with spray paint because that's just what you had to do. Yeah. But I never actually like spray paint that much. Mm-hmm. Like it takes a lot of practice to be able to get good at. That's fine. But what I hated was just the, the, just the, the, the shit that you'd have to inhale mm-hmm. and not always get like, on a, you know, you're doing a big crime tunnel or, you know, doing a go. You just get, you inhale so much and the next day you're just paying for it. And like... Back then I wasn't, you know, I was doing a lot, but it wasn't like the guys that have done it for 20, 30 years straight and heaps of them have got heaps of problems. But I'm glad that for some reason I didn't like spray paint. Mm. And then the shift into using masking tape, that was accident. Mm -hmm. And A happy accident. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing about it was that I didn't know anyone that was using masking tape. Mm -hmm. So in graffiti I felt like I've got this huge knowledge, felt like there was like titans on my shoulders. Like how do I do anything that's actually different? How, how can I do something that's my own without, you know, just being referential or differential to others? And so then with the masking tape, it was just free. Mm-hmm. It was just like drawing on the ground. There was no rules. No. Because there's no one, you weren't privy to anyone doing it previously. So yeah. you're like, I'll just make this up as I go along. And it, you know, I didn't think heaps of my graffiti mates would really care for it, so that's why I came up with a silly name, Buff Dis. Uh, so, okay, so let's that's interesting. So let's talk about where you did get that. We'll go back to the tape stuff, but where did that name come from? Are you disrespecting the buff or are you saying Buff Dis, you can't buff it? Well, the stupid thing is so I had this game when I was in Fitzroy, living in Fitzroy, I had this game where there was a council graffiti removalist that would go up and down Gertrude mm-hmm. and then... I thought it would be hilarious to write buff this with an arrow and, like, get photos of him. Yeah, right, bad joke. <laughs> so then I was doing that just as a stupid tag and then I started doing the tape and someone asked me, what's, what's your name, your tape name? And I was like, couldn't use my graffiti name. Yeah. So then it was like a joke because there's one time I'd done a bit of tape on the wall without knowing what I was doing, but the graffiti removalist came back, painted over it, thinking it was 
like oh. a paint. So then I came back and just peeled it off. Peeled it off. It's like he's done the stencil work for you. Yeah. So a silly joke. That's lasted twenty years or so. <laughs> Is that still there? That that No, 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 no. Oh man. I know. Um, okay, so you've got the name, you've got the new medium of tape. Are you using electrical tape, masking tape, fucking any kind of tape? What kind of tape is a tape artist fucking using? At the time, it's pretty broke. So it was just the cheapest tape. Mm-hmm. Whatever I could find, the the white painter's tape. Yep. And that was all I needed because I was just I didn't I didn't know what I was doing. I was just drawing on the ground, on the walls. With whatever I could get, then it was only until like I moved to Germany, where I met an actual like tape company, retail tape store that I realised there's so much tape. Yeah. And when I didn't have to pay for it, that was a lot easier. So you came up with this new style of tape art, mm-hmm. and then you got sponsored by a. Tape oh, this, company? that's that's further down the track. Further down like, the track. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. But <laughs> so you've you've gone to Germany just to travel and to what experience a little bit of life get out of the, the big bad city of melbourne and mm-hmm. go to fucking berlin or something mm-hmm. um so when you got there you're obviously meeting new artists and you just your eyes are being opened up i'm thinking berlin's a bit more liberal with people doing abstract kind of art and unusual kind of art mm-hmm. everyone's a bloody street artist in berlin mm-hmm. but no i think the thing was i think maybe it'd be what was great going back to when i started doing the tape in melbourne it was kind of funny like all of the people I really looked up to in graffiti, once I started doing the tape, they really appreciated the tape. And it was a shock because I wanted to become a great graffiti writer like the people I idolised. Yeah. But then by doing this weird thing that I thought was kind of embarrassing that kind of kept on the down low a different name. Well, actually, the, the name that I thought I'd come up with that was brilliantly original, met New, New too, and he comes up at the graffiti thing and he's like, oh... Yeah, like I used to write buff discs with my mate Tame and like all around, all the 90s. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> Shit. Is that all right? He's like, no, I spoke to Puzzle about it and he says he's doing good stuff. And I was like. Really? I'm, like that's so lucky. Like, So that you've, they've, yeah. so you can roll with yeah, it. Yeah, I bumped into Tame like last week out and doing this um, piece in Box Hill. And he, it was just so funny. Like what a coincidence. Yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, so but the, the tape stuff actually like. Probably the first time artistically where I felt my own voice, mm-hmm. where I wasn't just doing iterations of letters, iterations of other artists that I respected and putting my twist on it. It was all just me. And for better or for worse, it just felt real. Yeah. And do you find that the restrictions with tape made it easier to be creative? I know that kind of sounds like a little bit of mm-hmm. an oxymoron, but because you are restricted with what you can do, the colour palette and stuff, it means you can be more original? Yeah. My, my wife's a graphic designer and for the first good half of our relationship, it was pretty critical of my colour <laughs> theory and, of you know, basically graffiti. It's just like scraps, whatever. Yeah. Right. And no real actual sort of finesse. So then by that limitation of having just white or black on the city was really liberating because yep. it was like, okay, well, everything's an outline. Everything has got to be like good enough as a sketch or in the design. And then the location became that second aspect, like the actual context of the piece. Yep. So like the old brick houses, the abandoned places, that's where I like felt the most comfortable creating the work. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's something that's semi or non-permanent. So, you know, if you piss off the wrong people, mm-hmm. if you're putting tape on Burke Street, yep. you know, they say something, you're like, it's just tape. Fuck, so take it easy. For the first 10 years, it was pretty much just pretending I was in uni and saying, oh, it's a uni project, like cops, everyone. Just say, oh, it's for university, just doing some designs. Look, it comes off. Yeah. Then they go away. But then the best thing is that with cheap tape, when it gets UV for over 24, 42 hours, like you put some tape on a window, Leave it for too long, it's not coming off. It's like an eggshell sticker sort of thing, like peels off in pieces. Oh, eggshell. Yeah, the Hong Kong boys do great stickers. But, yeah, so it's funny, like, the permanency also became an interesting question of, like, well, if mine doesn't last or does it last, how long, what's the value of a piece of work? Mm -hmm. So when I do something, I didn't, I get a photo, but even if I didn't get a photo, it's like, well, how long does it have to last? And people can walk on it, and it mm-hmm. ages, and it it weathers, and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And so it's it's exactly. kind of evolving and organic in a in a way. In a small way, yeah. So tape, you go to Germany, mm-hmm. you're in this more accepting 
art scene that isn't so staunchly you do graffiti letters. I guess what's this? So like the mid two thousands. Uh, yeah, about two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. So street art is becoming a big thing globally. Yeah. Uh, Berlin's ahead of the game a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so you're there doing your tape stuff. You're meeting other people that are doing similar stuff or paste ups was a big thing back then as well. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess I still don't know how to define street art, even though I am, I guess, a street artist because, you know, I think there's a really accepted idea of stenciling as, you know, street art. And that's been around for ages, Black Lerat and going back to, you know, the early days of, you know, protest and activist movements, then a stencil is a really quick way to get a message up. But street art for me, I think, and graffiti, it's, I guess I'm going to be getting older, but it's less about the medium and it's about the surface. Mm -hmm. And when something is a commission or legal work, for me that's not graffiti, it's not street art, it becomes work. A mural. Yeah, but that might have, you know, graffiti origins, street art origins, but the actual putting of work up without permission actually changes the way the surface is seen. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's the most powerful thing about it. So an abandoned building, like, is an eyesore, but what happens when an artist comes in, spends three, four days on a piece, like, does that improve the value of the actual artwork because of the context or does it improve the property value? Like what if Banksy goes into a derelict building that's going to be demolished? They would put a fucking glass cabinet yes, around it. <laughs> that's 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 the that's the thing I find fascinating. Like, yeah, that's where the power I think I I find is sort of in street art or graffiti. So you've got to obviously balance this out because you do do a lot of now you know without jumping forward, you do do a lot of large scale sort of commission work. Yeah, and that must be hard to balance with your artistic side as well. Well, not now. Luckily, I feel like I've got to a point where with the work that I'm doing, it's what I'd be doing if I didn't have permission. Or like, it's what I'd be doing anyway. Don't tell the clients that. <laughs> well, Because they're paying you. Well, I mean, I don't have to paint pretty girls' faces with flowers and birds yeah. and, you know, I, you know, maybe I should and that would be, be a lot more successful. But I feel comfortable now that with my work, it, it's very honest for what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, even though there's a lot of colour work going on now, it's very linear. And that's the most sort of the the most honest work I think you can do is with a line. Yeah. And so then for now, when I get a commission work or so on, it's a lot of the time it's like, well, here's what I want to paint, and if it's not that, then it generally is pretty close to what I'd be wanting to do. Yeah. Well, you found yourself in a pretty good position. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's go back to Berlin. You've got now the opportunity to use different tapes, which I know sounds kind of crazy because I guess we're limited to what tapes we've got at fucking mm -hmm. Mitre 10 and Bunnings and shit here. So you're there, you find a specific tape manufacturer mm -hmm. and does that just open up the fucking creative doors for you? Massively. So it was pretty lucky. It was a store that would actually buy all the offcuts from major factories, take it in-house, had the machine that would cut it down into whatever length. So it was going from like however much money I had the bank account, office works, to like boxes and boxes and then and they're that, still on rolls yeah yeah, it, yeah 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 so they just cut the whole wall, roll down but then they could get like one mil right like pretty amazing stuff and they sell it to each of the car detailers and anyway but the main point was like it opened up a whole toolbox and i think i went pretty hard on like okay how much detail can i get into the work how much how much like scale that opened everything up yeah and to a point where I think the last, yeah, when we were chatting about Tom you know, Aon, his, the last podcast I did with him was, I think I was at a point where I realised I felt like I'd pushed the tape to the end of what I could do with it and I was actually getting really sick of black and white. Yeah. No colour. Mm. Yeah. But so with the, even with the tape and this tape, so that there wasn't colours on options, it was still you were working monotone, but there must have been there, red and blue tapes. And there's some colours, but they're all pretty primary or fluoro. And I got to a point where there actually, there's a lot of artists that use tape now, even at the time that were using a lot of colours. But for me, it got to the point where you're like, well, the amount of time it was taking to block out areas and merge different tape colours next to each other, it's just paint. Yeah. Why not paint it? Yeah, yeah, I guess, and that you lose why you what initially 
intrigued you about it was that it was limiting. So then once you get a plethora of different types, sizes, colors, mm. weights, you're like, all right, well, why don't you just fucking paint this? <laughs> well, and for me, coming back to Australia, it was like the scale, you know, and permanence because mm-hmm. our weather in Melbourne especially, it's <laughs> fucked. Like it's, I love it, but you can't no. guarantee what you're going to get. So for me, it was like, okay, shit, how am I going to get stuff that's going to last longer yeah. than a few weeks? And paint became a big thing and I wanted to use colour. So then, yeah, so the last sort of five years, it's just been all paint. It's all paint. But with the tape, and obviously I'm an outsider who doesn't really understand the intricacies of making artwork with tape. Mm. When you bend it, is it, are you literally just making multiple creases to it to curve slowly at one degree per no, curve? No, 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 there's a trick. Where you – so if you put a piece of tape on a wall – Yeah. I don't know where the camera is, but <laughs> all you do is you keep the end of the tape off the wall and follow the curve down with your thumb. Oh, so you can manipulate it. Yeah. Right. And then there's different – better tapes for that stuff. And I kind of, that it's interesting because that sort of – getting curves in the tape became a bit of a motif for me, mm-hmm. but then it actually became like a big direction of my work and – to this day, so all the contours I'm doing now, it actually started with that yeah. frequency of line and the simplest thing of putting 10 lines next to each other, but if you change the spacing of it, you get that optical effect yeah. and then there's a lot like you can... Like a colour halftone print almost. And it's just playing... I mean, it's funny, there's this great song that I always think of, like the Ra Project with Melbourne Crew called Trick of the Light and so much of art is just, especially just Trick of the Light mm-hmm. and, you know, there's... Margaret, the, this is not a pipe painting. It's well, I find that you can get so technically proficient at creating something that looks like the real world, mm. but with cameras, with so much digital capacity these days, I'm like, well, wh- where's the human touch in that? Like, it's almost like why not just half tone print it and have a direct replica of this Chanel advert, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas I think I'm finding a lot more appreciation for like the abstract and being confident like different artists I find like I see their work and I see so much confidence in doing something that's not representational and yeah yeah do you find that in the Berlin community it was obviously accepted you know whether you did paste ups whether you did you know um, whatever kind of street art you did the mm. people were accepting and when you come back to Melbourne had that changed when, since you left um I don't. I guess it's hard. Like Berlin's got a pretty staunch graffiti culture mm-hmm. and very traditional. But even within that, they're like pretty like pretty open. But I guess the difference I found coming back to Australia was the general freedom that I found in Berlin in Germany. Like no one's looking you up and down at your the brand name on your jacket. No one's. No, if you're wearing a tutu. On Tuesday and skateboarding or rollerblading down the street. No one gives it, it's not a fucking political statement. Like it's just like, oh, okay, yeah. Tuesday. Whereas here it's like, okay, what's this significant? Why is this outfit? What does that mean to me? Who, what, are they, what are they promoting? Mm-hmm. It's just this strange thing where I think the freedom of graffiti and street art in Melbourne I think is almost more repressed than mm-hmm. other places. But in that, like, you know, you've got that extra limitation and – if you're going to do something different in it, you've got to believe in it. Yeah, I guess. And it must be, you know, you go over there, you see the way that the other side of the world lives, a bigger city, even though Melbourne's not a small city, but you see a bigger city, you bring those ideals back here and you think, oh, all right, well, I can I can bring this whole new sort of, a new movement of, of art back here and, and, and take what I've learnt from there and sort of put that into my work when I come back to Melbourne. I think it was... Maybe not as selfless as that sounds. It was probably a bit more selfish. Because like, you sh- wanted to borrow from there and then, yeah, okay. Well, actually, I think one of the things I struggled with over in Germany was like with the tape stuff, a lot of it was quite, it was all figurative. And so I'd do a lot of work about not just political things but like emotional shit. And then I found this point where I was sort of wanting to sort of express myself more but didn't feel comfortable being a, being a migrant, like being an, out, an outsider. And as soon as I got back to Australia, I actually felt like, oh, like I can actually do work here and it's going to be about the area mm-hmm. and felt 
like a, the connection to the land that was like legitimate. And it's just a strange thing because for what I lost in certain freedoms, I gained a lot artistically coming back. Mm -hmm. And have had you at this stage moved on to working with colors and stuff? Are you still yeah. keeping it limited? Yeah, no, that is, yeah. So I came back. I thought I'd come back and get off the boat and all my friends would be like, sweet. Like everyone's, and when I got off the plane, it was like, oh, everyone's moved overseas. Yeah. All the old galleries and, every, you know, not everyone, but it was like, ah, oh, got to start again. So I literally did. But with that, it's been, yeah, like maybe a, a revitalization of my work, coming back to Melbourne and shifting back into paint. Yeah. And I think for any artist, it's important to get out of the hometown and fucking see the world a little bit. Obviously, mm. you didn't just stay in Germany. You would have traveled around a little bit. You see how different cities, Massively, you know, yeah. what's happening, different cultures, how little subcultures work in different cities as well. I think the best thing was having the Melbourne card when we traveled. Like, it just even when I've done a lot of travel on my own for work or different projects, just there's something unique about Melbourne that it just I think maybe it's the diversity maybe it's yeah just demographic in general but being able to go overseas and have that already that understanding already mm -hmm. was probably one of the most useful things and then yeah coming back it's sort of yeah it's interesting like i think up until about last year i'm pretty happy living at the surf coast surfing every day and then now i'm like starting to get the itchy itchy feet to get back overseas again yeah do a bit of traveling and to experience i think yeah, you've got, to, you've got to get out of your comfortable bubble. And as we all get older, man, it becomes easier to stay where you're comfortable. Well, well, had, so in saying that, now that you're out of Melbourne, like does it still feel like Melbourne, home, or does it feel like somewhere you've got to go for work? Oh, man, I don't Look, we're only an hour down the road and it still feels a bit like Melbourne. But, like, mm. I don't know, we all get to the stage where, where we grew up, like, you know, I didn't have a backyard, you know yeah, what I mean? Like yeah. now you come over to my place, I got a mini ramp. That's epic. So no, yeah. but like they're they're kind of things that you you mm. how look unless you've got fucking three million dollars, mm. who's got a mini ramp in I'll the probably, city? You probably call it seven now. <laughs> probably seven million. But you know. it's funny because you know when I was listening to the the Jaffers podcast, like talking about and Tom and the sale yards, like yeah. how much of a significant factor the city was. Yeah, like you just there wasn't a question. You wake up. Get your board, get your can't just go to the city. city. Yeah, sale yards or like, and it was just such a strange thing now because we've both got sons, and now I think about what the city's going to be for him. Because why would you go to the city when you buy everything online? Line, yeah, and like everything's on. You know, all the cool stuff happens social media. Yeah, like why do you need to get into the city, man? Well, that's it. We would at twelve years old jump on the tram, be in the city. You yep. know, hang out. We'll go to St Kilda, hang out, do this shit. I don't know. My kid's not that old. But at 12 years old, man, mm. we would do that and, like, it's not like our parents didn't care. No. But it was just what you did. Like, yeah, you we just, just had, went we around. had the little church of little hustlers. and <laughs> <laughs> All that sort of stuff. Like, yeah. But, yeah, I think uh, it's it's different getting out of the city now, and I think the city has changed. It wasn't that busy then, man. You mm. could, we could go skating down St Kilda Road on Saturdays. You'd hardly see a person. Mm. Um, you know, the city was pretty quiet on the weekends. There was only really junkies and a few people going to the movies and going shopping. Like, it wasn't yeah. a busy place. It's different now. Like, And I wouldn't be letting my 12-year-old just roam around the city. No. <laughs> no, it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> but even just, yeah. Yeah. I guess it's funny because... When, as we, the era that we grew up in, we had that sort of, that early internet uptake we had, but that, that I think the discovery, that adventure mm. of being young and going to the city and finding the areas like where you weren't supposed to be, like abandoned buildings and stuff like that, like I'm sure it's still, you can still do it. But for us, that was just such a common thing and such a like, character building experience of like meeting junkies in a warehouse. Like what are you going to yeah, do? Like totally. Man, we would catch the tram into the city, then catch the V line to fucking Geelong, then catch the bus to mm. Warren Ponds to skate a concrete skate park. They've just upgraded it. It's pretty good now. <laughs> they had that <laughs> sick spine ramp and everything. Yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. the extent that we would go to just to skate a concrete skate park because yeah. I think eventually they built one in Camberwell, which mm. is nowhere near where mm. we were, mm. but we would go all that way. And that was part of the fucking adventure. And that's the thing. Like I find that maybe one of the most useful things I've had 
growing up in Melbourne and with street art is that adventure of like just packing a bag, not knowing where you're going to end up, mm -hmm. but just that freedom. And I mean, usually you're breaking and entering or, you know, <laughs> trespassing or whatever, but the, that, I think it's just, maybe it's like actually the viewpoint, like once you start skating, you can't see stairs and not think of like them as a path, for, mm -hmm. like or a handrail or something with a, a curve. You can't see architecture again. And I think it's the same with graffiti. Like I can't see, if I'm on a train line anywhere and I see like an old building, then it's just like immediately like access point. Like you just want to go and explore and the stuff you find there. Like Yeah, I think all, all graffiti <laughs> artists or, you know, riders and skateboarders look at surfaces differently to, mm. than to most people. There was a, a spot near where I used to live. I'm like, man, someone's got to paint that. Someone's going to paint that. Mm. And I said to my partner, I'm like, oh, they finally painted that thing. She never noticed it just because she's not looking like that. Yeah, I mean, you can always tell on the train, like you're watching someone's eyes, like that are they having an <laughs> epileptic fit or they're like riders. Yeah, but <laughs> sitting backwards. Yeah. So you get a better look. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's really useful because it's just a different way of looking at service in general. Mm. And so. You know, it's a bit like when it's. I find it amusing now that councils are so supportive of street art and commission murals, and like it's an anti graffiti thing. But what I find funny is that you're only going to get good stuff if you use people that have that graffiti eye or yeah. that sort of street art experience. And otherwise, it just looks like a rural community mural, like that doesn't have any essence in it. Yeah. Because. Back, look, I've never really been that into graffiti as far as partaking in it. But when we were younger, we used well, to get. What's, what's the difference? <laughs> well, no, no, because I just don't, I'm not practicing. I'm not. I'm not yeah, in yeah. it. But you've when, retired. Well, well, I never was really. But the thing yeah. is, it, with when we were younger, I, because I could sh talk shit, I would speak to these venues and get them to let us paint a mm. mural. Mm. But see, now those murals are actual murals mm. where we would go in there and go, hey, you've got a lot of tags on the side. Can we paint a mural? Which was basically like saying, can you let us paint graffiti on the side of your building? Yeah. But now a lot of those walls are going to the street art kind of mural, actual mural things. Yeah. No. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we had some... Had some funny murals that we asked permission for, didn't we? <laughs> we, we definitely did. It's uh, I, What I think is, is kind of funny with some of your work is I've seen stuff that we painted illegally now that you've been commissioned by the council to actually paint. <laughs> as well, I'm, I'm taking back my spot and getting some money for it at the same time. <laughs> How do you find navigating these sort of, you know, commission or legal spots? Is a lot of it just having a relationship and knowing how to conduct yourself with these powers that be? Yeah, I mean, I think what's, you know, a tricky thing is like there are spots where I've, you know, had to go, no, like it's not, in, like you can get something on it, but it's not fair. Like it's not the right spot to take, like just because I can get some money, feed my family, like it's a bombing spot, like that belongs, like as bombing. And councils are starting to get a better understanding of that. And I guess, look, the way I see it is that there's, a lot of walls around and if there's something that you know if someone has a good piece on there and someone asks you to paint over it you've got to just treat it with respect yeah either speak to them or don't do it so you think that even if the council give you permission you still need to get the all clear from the person if oh, it's definitely. been there for a long period of time i'm guessing oh even if not i think it's just a respect thing on on the level like yeah like if, like, I think the nicest thing is to understand your work's not going to last forever. Yeah. And that if you get too attached to the idea of permanence, then, then you, you know, if you look at a wall and you, you, then it becomes almost like a billboard. And, like, what's the difference between that and an advertising piece that someone gets cleaned every, every yeah. week, every month? But in terms of the actual space, like, yes, a lot of the street art, that I see now I don't really like. Not all of it, but like there's a lot that I don't like, but at least these walls are actually getting seen as creative service. Yeah. And that's good for writers, good for street artists, good for just the city in general. And 
yeah, I guess as much as I'm becoming a grumpy old man and like, you know. <laughs> but can... do you find that the whole thing is getting a little bit fucking watered down and homogenized because you're oh, seeing yeah. a lot of these inner city areas where they're just like, put a put a mural here, put a street art here, do a street art there. And Look. then it's like they, they used to be like kind of cool pe- like works there and now there's a lot of, like you said, flowers and shit. <laughs> if you want another couple of hours, I can talk about <laughs> Local nature and botanical works. Yeah, yeah, no. But I mean, we don't want to. Do, like, there are people that you know that we know that make a lot of, of money. Doing and that. I've, look, I got. To, and I respect everyone that's you know hustling and making making a living out of painting walls. And it's not easy. People think it's like a glamorous life, but I mean, it's not too bad. But it's still a grind. But I think I agree that the tricky thing is it's when there wasn't that much money or any money except for like paint or whatever you got what was real now that the powers that be or however you want to put it it it's a dilution of that power that was with the artist and so what you're kind of hoping is that with less say anti graffiti council based initiatives what you're getting is more like sort of mural festivals that are yeah. organized by people that have got skin in the game that understand that there needs to be a actual Something of substance. Substance and a diversity of aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get a really sort of engaging bunch of art that you don't have to pay to see. Because that's the biggest thing is that (sighs) there's technical capacity in street art and graffiti that is great, should be admired. But what I think is more important is actually having like a diversity of voice on the wall so that instead of just getting this kind of character, this girl, this pretty girl, this, you know, the the people that are trying stuff, they're still doing it. It's just not popular, Instagram popular, whatever, until yeah. until councils get the tip. Do you find, though, that with a lot of these councils that they are playing these artists off each other, they're getting quotes, they're getting things, they're saying, we're going to do an expression of interest and you've got to get in here and whoever nails our multicultural brief the most gets this wall. Yeah, I mean, the way with that stuff you've got, you need to get three select, you know, shortlisted artists. You need to get three So there's full like transparency, so they tell you yeah. there is you and this person or yeah. they might be disclosed who it is. Yeah, so they have to do that and then... You know, what's good is that a lot of the time they're actually consulting with people that are in the graph game, in the street art game that, you know, have history and so that it's not as diluted as just a, you know, what's going to tick the most boxes on our buzzword, you know. Yeah, at the council meeting. But in, you know, it's, I can, what I think maybe is the changing of the gut, the generational gut. So... You know, councils spend so much money on graffiti removal and there's a lot of links, I think, with the companies that get these million-dollar contracts. Well, what if you diverted some of that money into supporting local artists, creative work, people that are already doing this stuff for free or with the risk of getting fined? What if you diverted a bit of that money into creating work that's not going to get touched? Yeah. Like you get a win, you know, and I think if it needs to be graffiti based, it's graffiti based, street art, whatever. Like I think there's just a more intelligent way to be able to think about public space. You are just, look, kids, I'm going to say kids, grown up people, are yeah. still going to tag. You're always going to tag. People are going to do that. They're going to do their throwies. It's never going to. I mean, I, I hope think, that never stops. Exactly. Yeah. So that is a huge part of it. And I think a lot of these cancels and stuff have the wrong idea they also think that a lot of these people doing it are school age kids and sure in the school holidays there probably are kids doing it but i think most of them are grown adults that are choosing to do this stuff and they're just not attacking it in the right way and it's never going to go away that's part of the fucking culture but i think there's something critical about the, the there's a there's a there's the amount of vi- the hate that people have for a tag oh, they hate speak it. something was, I think that there's a bizarre sort of like it has to do with I think the idea of like maintained society mm. and so when there's a tag it's almost seen as like a crack in the foot pavement and that once you see that crack then the idea of all these you know young kids 
bringing down property prices, vandalism. It's sort of that, that end times idea. It's just bizarre because, as we know, it's just kids scribbling their names. It's calligraphy. I mean, some better than others. But I find it really depressing when I go to a city like Singapore or different countries where there's so little graffiti because it's missing, it's missing something. something. Yeah, it's missing a bit of and soul. All these, all, these, all these older crew that I think really hate, my baby boomers specifically, that hate tags. It's like, well, hang on, you guys were punks back then. You had bugger up. You had all this active... You, know, you talk about graffiti fondly when it... You know, but it, at the essence, it's the same thing. It's taking someone else's property. Mm. But public surface and using it creatively... So, like, why are you getting so pissed off about a tag that someone's done that doesn't really damage the surface, doesn't really do much actual damage when there's so much fucking horrible advertising that you drive past every day... And accept. ...happy. Like, I, like, I can't stand having to look at all these podcasts... Like, I mean, podcast. billboards, <laughs> podcast advertising. Like, but just, yeah, it just astounds me that you're happy to have stuff pushed everywhere mm. that has no substance other than, like making you feel bad so you buy this brand, like that kind of thing, where people are doing this stuff and it's just a tag. Like it's just a, someone's writing their name, which is so such an ancient process that mm. I find it bizarre. Yeah, it, it is totally weird. And with like local Facebook groups, it's always like, oh, get these kids, go and find these kids. And I'm, I feel like going... Well, trick is just do it with tape and then yeah, pretend well, it comes off. <laughs> the thing is 99% of the time they're not school kids. They're people who that's what they fucking do. That's how they express well, themselves. Well, functioning, contributing, vandals. Vandals. Well, <laughs> that's it. Like most people that are still out there actively doing tags and painting and stuff, not all of them, but a lot of them have real jobs and kids and stuff and that's part of it. I don't think the Karens and the, and the keyboard warriors can comprehend that somebody who has a real job spends their time doing that stuff. But then I find it... Quite amusing that the same people will generally have like a, a welcome to like a Melbourne coffee table book that you know is full of ever fresh, full of Banksy, full, you know. Yeah, don't look at the coffee table over there. <laughs> There's no Banksy. I do have the ever fresh book though. Oh, did you sell it? <laughs> no, apparently it's worth a bit now. Mm, mm, but yeah, not King's Way, but it's worth a bit. No, not no, I haven't opened mine. Really, I've still got all the inserts and stuff in there. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Um. So with a lot of artists, they always have to play that balancing game with make a living and doing your art. So a lot of people I speak to, they do tattoos, they get into graphic design. Was doing like, you know, commission work, something that just came natural? Was that the the, the, the most uh, natural evolution for yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think I was pretty lucky because with the tape, no one was doing it, so it had a novelty aspect to it. And at the time I was doing computer science or like, well, hating computer science and just doing websites. And when I got asked to do a tape piece for a commission job, it paid as much as a website. Yep. And I was like, fuck this. Like, okay, sweet. I'm You're just... doing it anyway, so you may as well get paid a fucking Well, I was like, well, why do I hate doing websites? Let's just see if I can do this. And that was, what are we, almost 20 years ago? Yep. I mean, it's been pretty up and down, like, I've had massive jobs that have been amazing. I've had times of, you know, pretty skin and... Like any artist. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've been lucky, like, I've been really lucky. I had a lot of people support me over the years and people that really appreciate my work and even as it evolves, it's sort of been, yeah, it's been nice to know that, like, okay, even if I'm sort of not, if I'm doubting myself at one point, I think I can trust in like trying something new mm -hmm. and then it seems to seems to be yeah like able to keep me going and keep a family going with yeah support of my wife as well <laughs> do you think that the non-permanent nature of the tape helped you with the early days of the commission because yeah companies and stuff would be like okay well we can have this yep. and when we're sick of the street art we can mm -hmm. fuck it off mm -hmm. I mean it's funny because like so many people will be like oh you know oh it's great because it'll come off but with tape, it depending on what the surface is, it can really rip shit off. Mm. And I became a lot, yeah, came, then as the projects got bigger, people want stronger tape, people want stuff that lasts for ages. You know, if you're paying 100K for a hotel to get done, then you want it to last. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, it's funny because for a time in when I was using the tape, it was super um, figurative. So a lot of hands, a lot of, uh, figures and 
you know, quite a few projects that have to do what the client wanted and it was just, just to get by, like mm. to be able to contribute to Sophie, my wife and I, like, you know, just to keep food on the table, like what, whatever I could get I was doing. Yep. But then as I guess my confidence grew and my ability with the tape grew, then it became more about actually what I wanted to do or more detailed work in the area that I wanted to explore. Yep. And I think that was where I felt maybe like that was the first time I felt like a real artist when I could just do a job about with work that was about what I wanted to do mm. as opposed to like, okay, how do I fit this brief? Yeah. Because you have found yourself in a pretty good spot that I think a lot of artists would love to be in where they you get commissioned gigs but they want your style. I think a lot of people yeah. – that are artists, they do their art, and then they have to do, they have to take a lot of fucking client inter- interaction to get there. So now you've sort of found yourself yeah. stemming from that art that you can do your stuff in the buff disc style, and they know what they're getting. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I guess I'm lucky, but at so many points, like I doubted myself and like felt like like a lone sheep. You know, like not only am I using a weird material that is from like stationary aisle and office work. You know, like it's not like a cool cool medium or it wasn't back then. And, you know, you meet riders and then everyone's like, well, where's your ultra ride? Like where's your, you know, bolt cutter? Like it, it wasn't very cool. Mm. But what I found was that freedom to just to explore. And initially like I'd paint, use spray paint and the tape and so on. But the most natural thing was to actually like just do what, I'd be sketching in, in a black book, but just do it with tape. Mm. And then, yeah, I think it was sort of, I, like I, I guess I just feel lucky that I found it at the time I did. Yep. Because I was sort of in a love-hate relationship with graffiti at the time. And then this became just a breath, like a freedom path. And now is there a tape art scene? Did people, like mm. obviously you weren't the only one doing it, but to your knowledge I guess you were. Yeah. But you, over that journey have you met other people that were doing it or have you become privy to other people who were working with that yeah. same medium early days? Yeah, I mean there's full tape crews now and like, I mean, yeah, it's funny because I think maybe, you know, when I was younger I had that like arrogance of like, well, it's my thing, don't touch it, the graffiti mindset of like my, my, mine. But, yeah, there was a New Zealand, I think, or maybe an American couple that are in New Zealand that they were doing tape ages ago. Not sort of street, like not with a graffiti eye, but were doing it more like public art. And then there's a great bloke from um, Italy, from Milan, called No Curves, which is funny because my tape all became about curves, but he's a top bloke. And back, remember MySpace? Yeah. Met him on MySpace and we're, we're good friends. And Was he in your top eight? Oh, <laughs> Oh. Remember they had the top oh. eight on MySpace? Mate, that re- it just reminded me like disguise. Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah. It, so, But what was nice is that when I got to Berlin, a, a scene started to grow and those guys, a lot of the guys from that scene and girls are really impressive and I love that they've continually continued to push the medium and they do a tape convention with your artists you use tape all around the world and it's really impressive to see see that growth even though i sort of feel like i've like left it behind a bit yep but you can see the um the relevance and where you came from with the tape in your in your your most recent work there's a lot of that line work and curve lines so you have taken from that but you've just taken it in a different direction a more permanent sort of direction yeah and i think it's like I think it's just – it all comes down to line, doing lines. <laughs> lines, yeah. <laughs> and even that funny conversation about a tag, right, like how much people hate tags, like I think when you see a good hand style, what you see is this great sort of ratio of space to the lines mm-hmm. and I find now with my work that – is based contour based, so actually use like um, land and um, land survey spatial map government app that actually five to one meter contours of Melbourne and then Victoria in general, and I use those maps to link 
to the land that I'm actually working on. Yeah. And so then it's funny because yeah, do you explain that to the clients, or do they just think it's pretty colours sometimes? Well, some, well, a lot of them come through and they're like, oh, we like your lines. But a lot of people realise it's contours, but not many realise that it actually is the contours of the wall yeah. of the area. And for me, it's sort of important because back to what I was talking about, like the honesty and the trick of the light with painting, is that even though my works aren't direct representations of land, for me, it is a landscape, and. It's the same as like, you know, you you have coordination points, coordinates. You have, you know, you can condense things into numbers. But then, what I find interesting is, well, how do you represent something with as basic as a line? And you know, that figurative aspect of like stick figure. Okay, but then, what else can you communicate with just the simplicity of a line? And that's where I'm finding enjoyment in my art now. And I guess you work monotone for so long and you've opened up the to the world of colour and you've fucking dived in both feet first, man. You, mm. There's no colours that are untouched now. Are you enjoying having the freedom to work with all those colours? The freedom is more to do with what mist tints I can find at Bunnings mm -hmm. and the mixing. Um, but no, a lot, like a lot of – so with my work, it's contours, but most people see it as like a bird's eye view, like down – what I like to do is actually think about it from the other way. So I'm looking up and that I like to get like sunsets or different skies or different stuff that's sort of on the land but that's from the ground up and that's what I use as my colour palette. Yep. And then when I'll be starting to do is deploy like terrazzo, like a rock sort of looks a bit asteroidy, but it, my idea is that it's all rock forms in the land. Yeah. So it's sort of like different layers of earth that I'm looking up from. But that's the idea. That's the idea. But it I mean, just looks pretty with... Nice colours, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think you've got to have something that's aesthetically pleasing to the client. You want to have something that is going to give the wall good coverage. So, you know, the for the client's point of view, it doesn't get vandalised. So you've got to you've got to use a lot of the space. You've got to make mm. sure that it looks good. So that sort of style is definitely ticking a lot of boxes from a client perspective. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's funny because like with a wall paint today, like. When I'm free, when I'm just having fun freestyling, whatever, it's the same stuff that I do for commercial work. Yep. And I think, you know, it's been pretty risky at times to like push that, but now it doesn't feel like I've got to segment the work. Mm -hmm. I just actually do what I really would like to do anyway. And bigger surfaces, you need time, and that's where I'm sort of enjoying. I've got a massive wall at home now. It's about two hundred meters by eight metres and that's pretty big and I can't use a elevated platform so it's been a lot of rolling, a lot of ladders but it's just it just feels more comfortable working on that scale. Yeah. And that's not a commission, it's just a yeah, passion project but I think I am realising that the scale is actually really important in my work now. Yep. When you are approached by a client and they have this big wall, mm -hmm. they know what you want to paint on there, is there a time where you have to say, well, no, no, I'm feeling this is definitely pink, red, yellow, warm. And they, do they push back and say, no, we really want these colours or try and push you in a different direction? Or is it you generally have creative control, you're at that point now? Well, a lot of the time it, it's not so much like my, I mean, with my work, it doesn't really lend itself to sort of like, you know, adding in, you know, multiple sort of things that will link to a brand. But... A lot of the time what I'll do is maybe three different sketches and they're completely different directions but with my style mm -hmm. and usually that's enough for someone to go, okay, well, this is this is what's going to suit. This is sort of what. But there are points when, you know, you really have to go like, I know what you're saying. And even if it's not just a, not a client for say, even if it's just a friend, you kind of got to like be able to explain, well, look, I understand that that's kind of what you're after but if we're able to do it a bit like this, then it'll actually be more appealing on a mm. you know on a longer term, but it's hard to sort of say that without offending you know someone's aesthetic taste. Yeah, I can from just friends that do that. Yeah, I'm a bit worried about like you as a client tonight. Oh, like, no, what are we, no. How's well, this wall going to go down? Let you have creative <laughs> control, but no, like it, I guess it's such an interesting scenario when you've got clients that aren't artistic at all, know what they don't want or whatever, and then I've got friends that always would have to deal with those sort of people mm, and try mm. and tell them. It's like tattoos. People go, I've got this idea for a tattoo and the tattoo artist says that's a bad idea or yeah. if the person painting the wall says it's a bad idea, it's because it's a fucking bad idea. 
Well, look, it's a tough game because I think, you know, what's tricky is like someone from the outside can see my work because I don't put all my work up or on Insta or social. Or, like I don't, I just, some like stuff that I'm okay with, I put up, some that I have to put up, I put up, but a lot of stuff I don't put up. But it's a tricky one because, you know, if you're purely commercial, if you're purely a commercial artist, then, you know, what does it matter what you're wanting to paint? Just make it look good. Just mm. technical proficiency. And that is a different area, I think, you know, like sign writing and so on. Like I really respect the, the craft. And what I think is that with if you're, if you're going to make a living from your work, your art, then I think no matter what, there's early stages, you're going to compromise, you're going to sort of be – but you're also learning, developing your art as well. So I don't begrudge anyone, but I think – the hardest thing is is gaining enough leverage, enough of a name that you're able to survive on your work but not dilute it. And that's the thing. I think a lot of people that probably would love to paint full time and that's what their dream is are probably not playing the game as they should. You need to get your body of work out there. You need to put in the hard yards. You need to build that social media profile yeah. so people know you and what your style is and it's distinct. And that's and that's what you that's what you're working all those years on. It's it's a tricky one because the what I'd say is that you need you know, but my vantage point's skewed because I can say in retrospect that what you need to do is work and work and work and work, create your own style. But then what I, you know, the hard thing is like when I started my work, there wasn't a street art, there wasn't a career. There wasn't, you couldn't live from graffiti. Like the, you could sell drugs and be a mad king, all city. Like, but that was like, that was the path. Yeah. And then street art came in, Banksy came in, which changed, and Shepard, like Shepard Ferry changed everything. And as, you know, regardless of what I think about the work, I have to really like appreciate the, 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 doors, they the open. doors they open and that, street art became, you know, a really palatable, palatable thing for the world, I guess. But I think regardless, you know, when we were painting and like whenever I was doing it, I didn't think it was a career. I, d I just thought it was something I had to hide from family and friends or like, you know, just secret hobby. Do, you, do your parents appreciate it now? They unfortunately have to see all my work all through Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> but do they no, dig they're it? Su they're super supportive, yeah. But I don't really make canvases and they've got one of my canvases. There's probably about... Two or three in the world, but you've I've seen you do like a group, didn't you? Like oh, a blue yeah. green, you did like the group show thing. Yeah, so that was the two. I did four canvases for that, and that's the first time I painted a canvas. Mm. For, or did a black one, and it's just weird. Like it's it, I've, it's really hard because I feel so uncomfortable working small. Yeah, and it feels like it loses so much energy, and I'm still working out how to do that. And I've got heaps of canvases. I owe people. I'm I'm painting them. I promise. Yeah. I'm just learning how to paint canvases. <laughs> learning how to paint. Well, that's like when I had getting up here and he did that roller piece up there and he goes, yeah. fuck, man, it looks like the space looked bigger. It's not that big. But, uh, you know, when you when you bring everything down to a, a much smaller space, it's a lot harder, I'm guessing, when you're used to working with like big square metre type projects. Yeah, and for me, I, I feel like with – so I think maybe even from the tape because everything becomes like about the human scale and – you know, if I'm doing a hand on the street or something, it's huge. It's oversized. Mm. And I think from having that experience or starting from there, for me now, I need that scale. And that's also with graffiti. You grow up with a letter that's six foot. Yeah. You know, you don't, like, except for, like, what Soffles and Lush are doing with the tiny pieces. Like, that's epic. But yeah. I think the scale is really important. And it's the same when you go to NGV or the a gallery and you see a painting that's two metres by one meter, ten meters by three meter. It's the enormity that I think really has the impact. So I'm learning how to translate that back. to yeah, yeah. But because a lot of your stuff is kind of like vectorish, you could just shrink it down. It's not vector, but I mean that just it's got, you just get some vinyl. Just, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like because it is yeah. they're solid lines, you can just do it on a smaller scale. Well, I've got I've worked it out that I tried all the I actually got an like seeing Tom Gerard like I got an airbrush and I was like okay I'm gonna learn to airbrush get the fades, and then uh, I, I threw it out I hated it I couldn't but I think he gave up at one stage almost as well I understand it was it was horrible, mm -hmm. and then 
I just actually went back to what I use for outdoor walls, just a generic like portable spray gun and just change the pressure. Yep. And so now I've got, I've got the gradient, I've got, the, I've got that aspect, the base. Yep. Now I just need to work out how I get the fine line work. <laughs> Seems to yeah, be, be yeah, make yeah. the most sense, man. <laughs> I, I haven't used tape for such a long time, but so maybe you, it, you wouldn't do a tape piece anymore. Like it's not really your thing now. I don't know. It just feels like a. It feels like another time. Yep. And it You've could matured. be fun. It could be fun to yeah. like do it again, but it, I guess I just feel like now my yeah now my work is like just so much about color and. I just I think I've fallen in love with acrylic paint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're doing these big, large-scale ones, you're talking like, you know, hundreds of square metres. Yeah. How do you even get your head around quoting something like that or or because you've got to use scissor lifts or knuckle booms or fucking whatever they are? Mm. You've got to take into consideration how much paint before you even think about, you know, the man hours on it. Yeah, it's tricky because you – I never used to like having a square metre – fee and then I realized that's what everyone wants they want to know how much this is going to cost they want and then I still to this day it's sort of a bit of a game of like well how much do you want to pay is there clauses when you do do the work that they say all right if it does get vandalized um, you have to come back and touch it up or is that something that's an additional thing or is that even spoken about yeah I mean I think you know like I don't get up anywhere near like I used to I don't expect my pieces to last, not be touched, but thankfully like most of them do last. But if there is a small tag or some throw-ups or whatever, I actually like to just paint the contours over the over the throw-up or yep. the tag so you can still see who's under there. The letter form's there. But it's but I'm taking the space back a bit. Mm-hmm. And I talk to clients about that and I, I think it's just fair because it's like it's not my wall. It is my piece, but it needs – there's almost like a like a dialogue with the city itself. It's like, well, it's almost like organic growth in the piece itself and that, you know, like if someone's having a full crack, well, we'll sort it out yeah. otherwise. But if it's just a tag or a throw, no worries. It's like an evolving piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about like talking about specific pieces, mm-hmm. uh, the Golden Fleece where near I used to live on Montague Street is a cool building mm. and that's – you've painted the whole building like as in rather than just one or two walls – the whole the outside, facade, yep. is that something that's cool to do? Do you look at it differently considering you've got so many spaces? Do you look at it three-dimensionally? Like how do you tackle something like that, the whole fucking building? Well, yeah, that was a good one because we grew up next to it and like, you know, there's a famous laneway coming yeah, up just around the corner. There's a famous it. laneway. Yeah, that's where I was going. It was a segue. <laughs> good work, good work. But, yeah, that was – I mean, I love working on that one because it was for good mates. Um, they've got a few venues in Melbourne and – was nice because they wanted this sort of Greek island vibe. Mm -hmm. So what I turned it into was like the pixelation of a sunset, Santorini sunset on the base. That's what all the pixels are going up into that sort of classic Greek white finish. But all the contours are based on South Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, most people you go past it, you drive it, you see nice lines on a Mm -hmm. colourful pixel base, but it all is actual South Melbourne. I mean, I think, I mean, it, it probably sounds terrible, but, (laughs) <laughs> Maybe it's megalomatic. Like I actually like getting jobs on the traffic route I most take through Melbourne mm. when I'm coming into Melbourne. So I've got pieces here, pieces there. And you got one on Hoddle? Yeah, yeah. I've got a few here. And, and then it's just maybe it's a selfish sort of way to like have, yeah, different paths where I can just keep looking at my own work. Well, that's it. And look, it comes back to the old graffiti thing that you want to – be seen and getting up yep. on Hoddle Street is definitely a way to be seen on Montague Street. Now that that fuck that area, man. Now that it's built up, there's it's buildings changed, everywhere. Though. I know brothels are gone, <laughs> shop shops are gone. <laughs> um, yeah, and we'll have yeah. There is a laneway around the corner just off Montague Street, so we have to bring it up. Um, there is a famous documentary, a Jizo documentary yeah. that is not just famous in Australia, but it's famous all over the world. I learned that. Yeah. Ever see? Yeah. <laughs> And for the people that haven't seen it, you can check it out on on YouTube. Um, I believe that you might feature in that documentary. Is that true? Oh, I've got a pivotal role <laughs> up a ladder when the boys get the paint ganked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. I mean, like on one part, like I didn't even know it was going to be in it, but 
I was like stoked to hear the Jizzo documentary came out and then when I watched it and I was like, oh, shit, that's me getting mm. rolled. Mm. But, I mean, look, <laughs> that's what it looks like. There's a bit of a setup. wasn't quite real. We did get the paint back. So it depends what you want to talk about. But I, I love that documentary as much as anyone. Yeah, people do like it. I, look, I've got my head in there as well. Um, <laughs> it's a funny scenario. So that wall was legal. I actually teed that wall up and we got permission. Mm. Um, that dude came through, pinched some <laughs> of the paint, pinched Benny's paint as, uh, as we know. Mm-hmm. What isn't in the doco and the bit that I will say when people find out that we are in it, and mm. I'm not a graffiti writer. That was something I just did when I was like 16 for you know, a bit of fun with my mates. Mm. Uh, we got the paint back, like you said. Yeah, I mean, we've got to, I'd go into it in more detail, but I don't want to say too much. But yeah, for those who don't know, it was a bit staged. We got the paint back, and we were only sixteen-year-old kids. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I thought I, when I was when I was up the ladder watching it happen, I was like, "What? What's going on? Like, who, why is Benny?" Yeah. Anyway. But more importantly, I think the the crux of it was he saying, "No, don't put up, don't put up SDM." And I was like, "Well, we're, we're a bunch of you know," but. SDM is probably one of the most important crews in my life because mm-hmm. discreet, jumble, method, trim, like these guys like were doing stuff that really resonated with me. It was creative work, dabs, like my, like the, the stuff that those guys were doing back then, it was like a breath of fresh air and graffiti. Like, mm-hmm. And it was unique to Melbourne. It was... It was powerful as that stuff. So for me, SDM was a really important crew and I think it actually defined a lot of the work I do now. Yep. Uh, Like I spoke about that with Mick when I had him on. Like everybody had a unique style. Everyone did their own thing. So when they would do these big productions, it was really cool. Like everyone's – there wasn't one kind of, you know, style. You could Mm -hmm. see everybody's, you know, um, personality or everyone's style would sort of shine through. And look, at that time, like a bit earlier, like I was – in awe of the German technicians, like when Lumet came out and they did Dime, the Chevron piece. Yep, yeah, Chevron went and got the black book done with him then and yep. met him in the drains. And But it was more just I was so in awe of the technical capacity of spray paint then. Mm. And so Mika, I mean, Jumble was like a god to me at that time because it was like so amazing the proficiency that he had. Mm. But what I think really inspired me about each of their work was that it was so unique to each person Mm. and there wasn't this homogenized like we're a big crew let's do i mean they did big rollers but maybe the biggest influence was also ari Mm -hmm. monk and you know like in melbourne there's a bit of a story there but as a bloke top bloke but the proficiency that he had the stuff that he was doing then like on the global scale was like it made me so proud to be from melbourne Mm -hmm. and when i traveled germany Met crew that he painted with, UK, the same, and everyone was like, that dude was so ahead of his time. But I think there's a, a Melbourne, at that point, there was just a Melbourne, like, power to the work that was happening. And even, like, a bit later on, like, Fibsy, even though Sydney, like, the stuff that was coming out of Melbourne, I think I was just really lucky to be part of it, even though I was, like, a lone wolf on the outside playing with Art Attack materials it was actually like such an inspiration to be able to go okay well you don't have to do this cookie cutter replicate exactly what everyone else is doing overseas like sort of thing it's like no just like trust yourself go hard do it well and yeah i'm indebted to having those guys like near me growing up and i think that that sort of for lack of a better term that street art movement could have only come around when the internet becomes a thing because then people start to see stuff now you've got Instagram, yep. you've got tape scenes, you've got sticker scenes, you've got kids that don't even get in, don't ever hold an aerosol can, but they claim to be part of this street art sort of thing. For, mm. And it's up to each individual to decide whether they are a part of it or not. But the internet has changed everything in that Massively, capacity. Yep. And yep. I, don't, I don't think it could, it could happen without the internet. I don't think we would have had that sort of fucking change. Not at all. And I think what was unique it was that you had styles that were – directly related to the area. I mean, yes, you know, especially like, you know, well, you can talk about the letters that were sent to murder from Germany and how styles were copied or translated or, you know, used as inspiration and that was very, 
you know, it was a postal system back then and it was flicks and a lot of people that weren't even in graffiti just taking photos of stuff in the, they saw on the street. Just but documenting. Exactly. And then when the internet came, then it took a lot of time. I think it was still really about like what you'd see on the street. Yeah. And I think that was that great point where like the document, the, you know, digital cameras became a thing. And then that was, went from photo bucket to like Flickr and you're able to have a you know great community and have that sort of genuine organic dialogue and learn from each other and so the people yeah and I was so lucky like with my I came sort of more into the Flickr era and then that was amazing like people I really looked up to overseas were just right like so genuinely like how why are you even looking at my stuff it's like tape like you you're a god like why are you writing to me and then Instagram now uh, there's a different beast because I don't think there was too much monetization going on with Flickr. So with a lot of your pieces, and you have done a lot, what are some that are uh, that mean a, a bit to you? Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot that I've done recently that are meaningful because, like, I've tried a new direction and then I've made work that it's more about the land that I'm working on as opposed to just, like, a pretty picture. Not to say, like, you know, discount the other work, but maybe, like... Actually, maybe one one of the most meaningful pieces was like a series of works, like maybe eight works in an old abandoned brewery in um, Berlin. And it was the first time I like took longer than an hour to do a piece. And it was it was all based on like uh, a friend, a re- a suicide of a friend. And there'd been another suicide before that. And it sort of culminated in me wanting to actually make some work that was about the pain and the sort of hate and anger that I was going through and what I wanted to do was make something really beautiful that expressed it and so it was a bit weird because I did like a (laughs) did a piece based on an opera and it was all with tape and it was all in different rooms in this in this old brewery and it was actually probably the best thing that I could have done at the time to stop feeling so down and like feeling so upset and all the problems that you have with that but so it was cathartic for me and because it was an abandoned building like barely anybody saw it except for like street artists and graph writers and but with Flickr I took photos and it became it really resonated with a lot of people and it made me realize like some of the hardest things that I'm going through I can actually translate into art and people can appreciate that yep yeah that's awesome man I guess like a, you know a a, a person that writes music can write a, a cathartic thing. I guess people with, you know, any kind of medium can make something that actually helps them get through tough times and that sort of stuff. And it's something that I've been doing workshops and so on with the youth and it is, I don't go into the, you know, exact Extreme, sort yeah. of stories of, you know, different pieces I've done, but by my own process, I've realised like that graffiti or more street art now like it saved my life so many times and I've been super down or upset and it is a really powerful thing that doesn't have anything other than I think the essence of creation at its heart and it is such a useful thing to have in life. Mm -hmm. You know, as an adult you sort of, you know, grow up and you're taught to draw in your free time but if the horse that you're drawing doesn't look like a horse when you get into year four, year five, then... It's the ones that draw a more realistic horse that keep drawing horses. Yep. And then what I think is really useful is to have a creative outlet that doesn't require, you know, perfection. Yep. And graffiti was that for me. But in my adult life, like, I need to be able to make work just to be able to, like, feel good about my life as well. Yeah, and look, it's a it's a thing that people say a lot, but you know, kids are, are are told to be creative, and then you get to a certain time, and then everyone stops drawing, you know. And that is something that we do need to, you know, take stock of. You got to be like, fuck, draw something, even if you're bad at it. There's no, there's no, there's no right or wrong. Draw something if it makes you feel good. Paint something. Do something silly. Well, I mean, even like going back to where we started together, like skating. You know, like I think skating before it became such a popular. Before Tony Hawk, mm. the video game. The video game, yeah. That it, was, it was still a subculture. It was still like, you know, 
skate parks used to be junky capital and like mm. if you're going to go skating you had to but what i loved about skating was like the way different people like would skate and you could see their personality yep. like jaffa like the way he'd like kick flip out of the Super sale yard steezy, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and just but just the way you see different the way you'd use the architecture of a skate park mm-hmm. and even just melbourne itself and yeah so i think that just self-expression it's really like the most useful thing I've got in my life and that I wish I can, I hope I can, you know, inspire that in others. Yeah, and now you can say to people, it's fine to be an artist where, you know, I think there wasn't <laughs> that many people. Well, when we were kids, there wasn't that many people that were told you it's cool to be an artist. No, now, like, like honestly, you, like that's my story. Like I f- feel embarrassed at times when I tell people I'm an artist. Yeah. And like all my, we were asking about it before, like I found I didn't study art. In, in high school or in uni or anything like that, it was always secret for me. Like I went the traditional route, what I thought would impress my parents was the right thing to do, tick all the science boxes, you know. Sneak get, out after comp- 9 o'clock. And then, yeah, but it's funny, when I was doing computer science, I hated it. It was so, it was so painful. Only thing that kept me happy was going bombing and graffiti and like that's what kept me, like a lot of people died at that time too. I mean, not to say everyone's. So not that dark, but the one thing that kept me going was like I had a secret life that I could create work in and be someone else and yeah. didn't have to have everything that was going on in my real life yeah. and I had crew that only knew me from my art. And actually that's the big thing I think with skating and graffiti, like you don't know who they are. You, there wasn't any ethnic majority. There wasn't, yeah. There's no, you just know see someone's work. Yep. And then you meet them. That speaks for themselves. Yeah. And then that was probably the most liberating thing with like street art and graffiti and coming out of skating was like it doesn't, it doesn't matter who you are. Like we grew up in a pretty diverse area which was great but travelling overseas and defining yourself as an artist and you realise like, oh, it actually is a really like unique area to have actually define yourself in and yeah. create an identity. So one thing I've noticed just with friends of mine and people that I've talked to obviously doing this podcast that I think a lot of people that get into graffiti, not all of them, but a lot of them have trauma or something. Do you think that makes for more creative people, (laughs) like in general? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I guess the how do you you be a good graffiti artist, first thing, to have divorced parents. That helps. (laughs) Childhood trauma. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think... Maybe you've got to have, like, in my time, like, you've got to be wanting to, like, be involved in, like, a like a subculture that is illegal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, skateboarding is a gateway drug. Like, I, not because it's that bad, but because back in our day, like, you got chased by security guards or everywhere. Like, but... I think maybe at this age now, the people I relate to the most are more graffiti writers mm-hmm. as opposed to street artists because I think it's just that you, you, you've you got a risk threshold and I find that in like maybe the commonality in board sports like surfing, skating, snowboarding, whatever. In graffiti it's the same. Like you, you've got to have that desire to be doing something you shouldn't be doing yep. and then that other desire to be doing it well. And once you get there, then you've got a camaraderie amongst peers. But, yeah, the, one of the most common threads is like you had shit that you're angry about or that you're upset about or like you didn't know how to well, deal with just whatever. Like even like I, I, like I like to say that even regardless of my conditions, like I had incredible supportive parents Stepfather, but is the most amazing father of the, you know in the world. But a real insight into like, well, you know, what it is to feel like angry, abandoned, to go through fucking shit, and you know, a lot of people can't make it. And then with the ones that you can, it's just something that almost is a base level that you find with a lot of graffiti writers or even really good street artists, there is that 
not sadness, I don't know, difficulty, mm. resilience. But maybe it's not just the visual medium, maybe it's the same with, you know. With any, yeah. Any creative medium that isn't celebrated by popular society, I guess. Yeah, well, you need struggle to create art in some respect or another, I think. Otherwise, you're not going to have that much depth to your work in any well, that's capacity. What, yeah, so I think maybe what's tricky is that I think there are easy ways to have popular work. And I think a lot of artists I know that are incredibly gifted graphic designers make shit look really nice. Mm. But a lot of the time there's nothing behind it. Mm. And I find that a tricky one because as you and I know, like as when we have chats, it's like, well, you can talk about the weather for 10 minutes, but let's talk about how you're going in life and <laughs> how hard it is to have a kid. <laughs> Just try to give it, give it substance. Um, do, have you found that your work and what you're doing now has been well received with the greater graffiti community? Do people like that? Do people get the that you used to be or you, you were a part of that scene? Or like, how is it? Because there's a lot of keyboard warriors out there that sort of like to say, this isn't art, this isn't this, this isn't that. And do, are you widely well received with that sort of stuff, do you think? We should set up a podcast poll. <laughs> no, uh, look, honestly, I don't know, but... I can say from my experience that the people I looked up to like the most in my world, my small world of graffiti, like have been really supportive of what I do. Yep. And that probably meant the world to me. Like yep. it did mean the world to me and to be able to – and I have to really thank like Ari, Monk, like Benzo introduced me and Benzo was a good mate, the South Australian crew, but Ari was someone that I looked up to as like – there's a, an American artist, graph, graph writer called Totem, and him and Ewok were like the guys that I thought were the best in the world and I wanted to, like my goal was to be able to get graffiti that was good enough to have a, you know, a like from them or whatever, mm -hmm. what, what, whatever that is now. But Ari was like, he was the one that said, Mate, your work's good, keep going. Yep. And that, when I heard that, I was like, okay, I'm leaving Australia, I'm going to do as much work as I can, the best I can. Oh. But it, and as much as I can say that was my inspiration, it was also lucky to have like lots of crew that just supported me on the way. Like, yeah, good chat. So, where do you sit on this sort of street art debate? With people say, "Oh, this is street art. This isn't street art." Is there a definition? Where do you sit on that fucking thing? Well, I reckon there's a really simple answer with a complicated context. So. <laughs> Simply, I think graffiti is letter-based and it's illegal and it's territorial and street art for me is less about territory and it's mainly figurative and I think characters in graffiti are supposed to be near graffiti, next to graffiti and characters outside of graffiti for me is street art right i think there was a proximity in the early days when street art wasn't known and so then it was just as vandalistic as the other but when it became popular that's where the definition changed for me yeah that once one was more acceptable and look i'm a beneficiary of it but diverge from the actual heart of what gives graffiti power. Because I think there was a lot of people doing street art that were a long way ahead of their time and they didn't, people didn't even really know what it was Yeah, and they were doing this art installation stuff, but there wasn't a way to put, a, to put, people didn't know what to call it. Yeah. I mean, like, I think we can go back to, you know, murder and demo like when, you know, there's billboards that were done back in the day that were that early acceptance of graffiti. And, you know, when you think breakdance was popular in its first wave and so on. And I guess for me, I think the biggest thing that 
change for me was realizing there were people that were getting into street art that didn't know what graffiti was. Mm. And then I, look, at the time when I started this track, uh, started playing with tape, there was a lot of graffiti aspects that I w was hating, like a lot of drugs with a lot of friends and, you know, there's so many people that were just more into it for the violence and the, and that's fine, like I get it. But for me as the guy doing the weird characters that was told to stop doing the arty stuff, <laughs> like I knew where I sat. Yeah. But I also found it difficult to like relate to a lot of street artists back in those early days, like going over to New York and meeting the Worcester Collective crews. And it was just, it was a lot of, there was a lot of sort of entitlement, I felt. Yeah, too much bravado. No, it was just entitlement. Like there was a sense of like, well, I get to put stuff up and it's prettier than this graffiti. So then like, but I, I, I couldn't understand that. Yeah. Because it's like, well, the whole point is like, as, you know, violent, and debauched as a lot of that graffiti culture is, there's a respect that is unique. And I think if you can make it in that game, then you're allowed to put your work up. Mm. And then if you don't have those stripes, then you need to earn them. But look, maybe that's just echoing a lot of like my upbringing in graffiti, but, and it maybe limits a lot of the output, but I think there's a authenticity that is maybe lost in the current street art. It, there's something to be said. Like I think everybody should know where their art form comes from and their heritage and the history. I think that's important and we're sort of older dudes now in our 40s. Mm. So like mm -hmm. this is sort Speak of – Speak for yourself. So, well, you're not quite then. But, <laughs> but like we – I am. Are, you are, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that, it's important I think to know where you come from from an artistic perspective but – there's also something interesting that happens when kids in the younger generation don't look backwards and they look forwards yes, yes. and then that brings inevitably change and things do change and things happen and you need that to evolve and there's something to be said about kids looking forward and not respecting what came before them because they're looking at it with different eyes. Well, so living in Berlin when I did, anti-style, which is – a very hated form of graffiti now in certain brackets was just common and you couldn't deny it because the crew that were putting that stuff up were prolific, mm -hmm. still are. Yep. And it wasn't about creating well proportioned letters, good kerning. You know, the, 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 the idea of making a pretty piece for the general public, fuck, gone. Yeah. So it was so impressive on that level. Like I didn't care for the letter structure I didn't care for you know the application but where they got up how many times they got up you can't deny it so then it was that question of like well what's good graffiti yeah is it pr the quantity quality if it's anti-quality but quantity it's still it's still getting up and look I think Graffiti is a young person's game because as you get older, you know, kids, mortgages, everything, the freedom of just fucking painting at night, regardless of your medium, like there's just, it's something that I wish everyone could experience mm -hmm. without getting caught. But <laughs> I think everyone knows that feeling and that even though there are these like little divides within the community of people that paint on shit without permission. It's like, well, you have to respect if it's not quantity, then it's the quality. If it's not the quality, then the quantity. And obviously the respect lies somewhere between in the middle there, I think. Most people think you can do things as much as you want, but it has to have a certain standard. Or Can, we, no, can we stop doing really, like, let's just go black and white, right. no content. <laughs> Oh, but I mean, yeah, so like a lot of the artists I think I really looked up to growing up were in that middle zone, mm -hmm. not so much as prolific, not so traditionally quality-minded, but were that kind of like off-centre, like, like thinking differently. But it's strange because 
so many of them I think would be celebrated now yeah. as pioneers in street art. Yeah. But were just sort of black sheep in graffiti. So, and that, yeah, that begs an interesting question that, that like some people, if graffiti, if, if street art was there as an actual avenue, would they have gone down that traditional graffiti route because they just wanted to put something out there to the per people and it wasn't accepted to just paint something that would be nice that didn't have letter structure? Well, I mean, Keith Haring and Basquiat, like Kenny Scharf, like there were people that were on the outside coming in, you know, and from people I've spoken to from New York from those early days, like it wasn't that harmonious, but, you know, it was that interesting thing where you, it 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 was the first wave mm -hmm. and the second wave that I think I'm part of was unique in its own way was free because there wasn't a known there wasn't a quantity that was expected it was fuck what's everyone doing what how are we going to how how are we going to collaborate let's let's paint graffiti writers whatever and then now I feel like the third wave is a very known quantity. And like Art Basel, like there's, it's a, a different game of there's a definite understanding of what pretty graffiti, what pretty street art is. And I feel like maybe there's something has been lost in the authenticity, but maybe it'll develop even better artists from both areas. Because they're looking forward and not looking backwards. They're kind of... And it's, yeah, look, I mean, I remember the amount of, like, there was hate towards a lot of the STM guys when I was growing up and I couldn't understand it. Like, these guys are, like, pioneering stuff and why do you need to have straight letter... Not, you know, why do you need to have traditional New York lettering that started in the 70s? I can't help but appreciate it myself, but you're not doing anything new. And the ones that got all the hate for like trying this new stuff, like pushing the envelope, 20 years later, they're celebrated mm -hmm. as pioneers. And I don't know, maybe I've got a bit of a biased like perspective because I guess my work was not traditionally accepted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, yeah, and you've got to think that there is a place for everything. There's a place for your traditional graffiti letters and graffiti characters and the character in between two pieces and all that sort of stuff. But there is a place for people to create and do whatever they want on whatever surface that they choose to. And that's their art. The, the beholder can say, I don't think it's fucking art, but the person that makes it is the person saying if it's art or not. I think, I think in Germany, I experienced an insight of how, organized and militant graffiti crews can be yeah. and it was so intense impressive like it wasn't didn't really matter about how good the piece was it was how big that chrome how big those letters how much it was like and it's executed like a oh, military operation no, beyond, like yeah. no, there's no getting on the bags there's no getting too drunk it's literally precision and i was in it was impressive and i really respected that but it didn't relate i didn't relate to it on the same level that I found like what what in, what attracts me to like surfing and skating and the counterculture it's not like free if you're getting yeah. told exactly how to do and what to do and look I get it like it's a it's a criminal it's you know it's a it's an act of crime and that of course you're going to get a lot of like drug you get a lot of aspects about it that are going to be about avoiding the law and you it is much better to not go bombing drunk than it is to be sober and have a strategic plan but that kind of funny thing of having the freedom of creativity i find like the ones that are a bit off center are the ones that are producing the better work mm -hmm. but it takes some time to be accepted yeah um man yeah i think doing something regimented and fucking militant that's great and it's awesome for an operation but if you're going to try and do something artistic and expressive it's lost the fucking idea that it has in the first place like for me like i mean we can talk like what was one of the most amazing things in my childhood 
well, it wasn't a full trial, but the, the whole car by the SDM boys yeah. was fucking amazing and it made me feel like Melbourne was on that international level yeah. and I was so proud of the boys when they did it. And the thing that kind of conflicts me now is that, you know, there's a lot of riders that have, like even solo whole trains have been done, but it's so boring. Like, sure, you can smash massive amounts of chrome, do some little black triangles and dots and, like, like that's an overlay. But then the biggest whole, the most amazing whole car for me is still Futura's brake. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Yeah. We can hopefully put it up. But it's, it's, it was a piece that didn't have any letters, abstract as fuck, but was just, like, shit. Like, that's the most impressive piece, the most evocative thing, like, for me, seeing that go past, not that you did, yeah, but like you didn't uh, in real life. <laughs> well, well it's just more was like fuck, like bigger is best, mm. but having something that is really thoughtful, I think, is kind of what's always intrigued me, and you can see it even just in letters, like the twins from Brazil, like Ajimos, that. The stuff that they do looks like another world. But the letters are so on point, they're so prolific. But I think what I really inspires me is that we've been in the game for so long, but this every new little piece they do is a tweak, is a creative like little twist on what traditional graffiti is. And their characters are another world completely. And I think It must help when there's two of them. I've always been jealous of the German twins. <laughs> They can paint trains pretty quick, pretty well. <laughs> but, yeah, there is a strange thing about twins and graffiti. But I guess I was listening to a podcast the other week and it was talking about how lonely a, an artistic life is. And I was sort of thinking, oh, that's funny because I've got good friends and lots of social – well, I tell myself that. <laughs> but – it is such a solitary experience of creating work and then a strange thing, even so many places I create the work, no one will ever see it mm -hmm. except for people trespassing and photos. And it's just a, stu it's a curious thing about the attraction to making work that's so private and then what is it about creating this stuff is it about yourself or is it about people seeing it? And I think a lot of people that do that stuff still don't even really know. Yeah. I mean, it's a strange one. It's sort of like, it's almost like an impulse. Mm. And there's, there's pieces that I've done that I'll never put online or never want to sh show anybody because they meant something to me that was not what I wanted anyone to see, but I still had to make them. So I don't understand exactly where that comes from, but it's an interesting thing about being prolific, being respected by your peers, but then there has to be something innate. There has to be something like, one of the worst things I fucking did was, I was in France and I was really drunk. I can't remember where I was. And then I saw this huge silo, like a grain, before silo art became a thing, it was a big grain silo. And I remember like, I'm gonna get there, I'm gonna. So I got all this tape, my wife went, fell asleep, went out there, I reckon I was there till, yeah, so sunrise was just coming up. I was so stoked. I spent about six hours on this massive piece on this um, aluminium silo. Sun came up, couldn't get a photo of it because of the glare. Yeah. So I just wasted six hours of like this big piece and I was like, but even though it was stupid, I couldn't get the photo. It was still like really fun because I had to climb. It was like really like, and I remember going to myself like, fuck, I can't get a photo, but does it matter? Like, It still happened. It's, but is it about the photo? Yeah. So then there's a lot of pieces like that. There's a lot about that with documenting it, I think, and, and now with people that are doing illegal work, they don't document it themselves because there's a lot of people out there that are documenting it for them, which is kind of cool because yeah. it's still getting documented and you're not keeping evidence on yourself. And that's a cool time, I guess, to be around uh, art, graffiti, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I mean, I think 
Well, it used to be shared amongst just your mates. You know, you'd go to the chemist, make sure you found a good chemist that would produce those photos without dobbing you in. Yeah. You know, flicks, like, it was a really communal experience and it was like you had the photo albums and it was like you'd shit, you know, it was a really kind of unique way to share art. Mm. And now with Instagram and like, yeah, like I, like I appreciate everyone that takes my photos and puts it up. Like that, I'm really appreciative of that. As long as they credit you. <laughs> but I think the thing that still drives me is actually having appreciation from peers. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, man, I will give you a chance to shout out anyone you want to shout out. We could obviously talk for hours, and we are going to talk for hours back at my place with more beers and uh, a couple more mates. But uh, is there anyone you want to shout out, or do you want to tell people where they can check out your stuff? Have you got anything coming up you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. I think I really want to shout out a photographer from San Francisco called Sean Roberts. I met him in uh, Sydney. And I was doing a, it was the first gallery show I'd ever done. Didn't have any money. Sophie, who wasn't my wife then, gave me enough money to get the ticket up there. And it changed my life when I met him. Amazing. He gave me the confidence to travel. He let me stay in his apartment in San Francisco with a degenerate street artist that was out every night. Um, but... I really want to thank him because he gave me that confidence to get out. Um, but more so, I think coming on this podcast, I listened to all the episodes coming up and I was a bit ambivalent about like how do I talk about Melbourne and my time and, man, so many of your guests were so impressive and it actually made me realise how significant Melbourne was yeah, man. to my journey and my hope is that for everyone that I have been able to like gain a lot from in the graffiti world skating just melbourne in general like i hope i can put something back to that awesome man that's a fucking great answer thanks man uh buff this thanks for coming man let's go drink some more beers let's paint a wall let's have some fun thanks for coming Three thousand.